uh, introduce our speaker tonight, Alex Yan. So off you go, Maggie. Good evening, everybody. So it's my great pleasure to introduce, introduce Alex Yan, um, who is a field ornithologist who's been raised in North and South America and has a PhD from the University of Florida. Um, Alex uh, uh, studies really bird migratory patterns uh, and investigates how ecosystems are changing because of environmental shifts and what that means for human health, food security and environmental resilience. And he does this at the Environmental Resilience Institute at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, what he does is forecasting uh, various infectious disease risks in places like Indiana and beyond. And what role do migratory birds play in that, especially with climate change? For example, uh, how this uh, robins uh, affect this and are affected by this. Um, I'm happy to tell you that Alex is highly recommended to us by Ken Myers, who you may recall is a, uh, an, a perennial speaker for Sarasota Audubon and head of the Avian Research and Conservation Institute in Gainesville, which is famous for the research on swallowtail kites and also on snail kites. Uh, so, Alex is originally from Illinois, where I understand his father was originally a farmer, but his mother is Bolivian, so he was raised a little in both continents, as he says, kind of a migratory bird himself in that sense. So with further ado, I, I welcome Alex. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much, Margie, for that nice introduction. Yes, I am a migratory bird from two continents. I was raised um, in both continents because, uh, yeah, my mother is from Bolivia. She immigrated to uh, the United States in the late 60s. And my father from Illinois, I was born in Illinois, but I continued to do research um, in South America. Um, my wife and I have lived in Brazil, Argentina. I continue to go back there with support of Indiana University, where I'm a research scientist now. And uh, the snail kite research I'll be talking about tonight, it was actually initiated um, at the Smithsonian Institution where I was a postdoctoral researcher a couple of years ago. Uh, well, more than that, about four years ago. So um, uh, yeah, you can see there on the screen, I'm crediting both Indiana University for where, you know, the continuing support uh, from them as well as uh, from the Smithsonian for this, this work that was started there. And really, the, I decided to continue work in Brazil because um, of the, the pervasive um, problems that are happening in terms of conservation challenges for birds like snail kites. As we know, birds live in all the habitats, major habitats of the planet, ocean and uh, terrestrial, such as the uh, habitats depicted here in this image. And they're facing threats throughout the planet. Habitat loss is probably the biggest one. Um, deforestation is a good example of that. But there's also others such as pollution uh, from industrial agriculture, uh, pesticides, uh, just industrial pollutants such as heavy metals as well. Alex, I don't want to interrupt you, um, <laughs> and I am. Um, do ahead. you have a PowerPoint that you're going to show? Because we only see you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me. We need to see, see some of your... Yeah, I forgot to share the screen. Thank uh, you so much. You see it now? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Let me just go back to the... Yeah, so that's... That's the, um, the, the, I was mentioning, I, I was a postdoc at the Smithsonian. So basically I, um, I'm now at the Environmental Resilience Institute at Indiana University, but um, 
was at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center in Washington, D.C. when I started this project. So um, credit goes to both institutions, really. So I was, as I was saying, birds inhabit all the major ecosystems on the planet, terrestrial to marine. And um, we really need to get a handle on the threats that these birds are facing in each one of these ecosystems. So as I was saying, may, maybe the largest problem out there for birds is habitat loss. They're losing grasslands, forest, um, in the oceans, uh, pollution as well is, is the problem. Um, climate change everywhere, um, unpredictable weather. Now in spring, birds are starting to migrate, as many of you I saw in the chat. A lot of those uh, birds heading northwards right now. Um, over, over time, they're going to have to adapt to this uh, changing springs. Uh, we're studying disease here in uh, Indiana in robins, uh, finding a lot of um, West Nile virus, for example, in robins. Um, so disease is, is impacting birds as well as humans these days, as we very well know. And urbanization in general, windows, uh, feral cats. So birds in the 21st century face unique challenges. And understanding the full annual cycle of birds is really key to understanding these challenges. Um, as, as a biologist, I'm trying to um, help protect a species, but um, if I only do that in the summertime in the breeding season when the birds are in my backyard, I'm only capturing a very small kind of scale of time in which um, that bird is experiencing those threats. So for migratory birds, we know that they're moving very large distances across the planet. And this image basically depicts that. These are the major migratory routes used on the planet. Um, so birds, you know, they, they're migrating anywhere from hundreds, hundreds of miles to thousands of miles and crossing oceans. But if we only study them in our backyards, say here in North America, in the summertime, we're only capturing one, one time point, one, only some of those threats, because as we very well know, a lot of these birds are uh, migrating all the way to Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil. So if we don't understand that full annual cycle of breeding, migration, winter, and then the migration back to those uh, breeding grounds, we won't really understand the complete set of threats that um, they're experiencing. And in terms of the snail kite, we honed in on this when I was at the Smithsonian, my colleagues and I, because it was a species that's found in many different places in the New World, anywhere from Argentina to Florida. But we only have a very limited amount of information on those populations. In fact, the snail kite has only been studied in Florida in terms of its full annual cycle, these movements. Uh, where does it spend the winter? Where does it spend the fall and spring? You know, where, where is it when it's not nesting? That kind of question has only really been studied in, in depth in, in the state of Florida, yet it lives in the Caribbean, Central America, and most, actually most of South America, at least tropical South America. So this is a pretty big problem for a species, you know, that we don't know its population trends in the neotropics there in South America or Central America. So we don't really know, first of all, is it declining? And second of all, if it is, what are those threats? And really good research has been done in Florida. Um, and this is the kind of research we're trying to emulate in uh, South America. So um, a lot of research, for example, out of the um, University of Florida, as well as the state agencies in Florida. Um, this, this paper here um, did a good job of understanding this dispersal patterns across Florida. So they tracked snail kites with satellite transmitters as we did in South America um, to show basically Flo Florida snail kites are moving pretty large dis distances within the state. They move anywhere between Southern Florida and Central Florida. And and uh, nesting in different places at different times of year. So if you see one in your backyard, you know, a good, the chances are if it doesn't have a nest, you probably won't see it for very long. They're, they're always constantly searching for snails because they're highly dependent on this resource. 
And that's something we're gonna be talking about here a little later in, in the discussion. The problem is in the neotropics, it's such a large range. We have no clue right now as to where these birds are moving. Like does the Argentinian or Uruguayan population of snail kites spend the winter in Brazil? Or are they moving up to Bolivia? Um, where do the Central American snail kites go? And there's this idea, you know, it's been out there for several decades that the tropics are stable, you don't need to move. But um, the last couple of decades of research has shown that birds in the tropics actually move a lot. Migration, it's called intratropical migration, basically, is very common in the tropics. So birds in Asia, Africa, South America, Australia, they, they're moving almost as much as birds in um, places like North, you know, North America, Europe. So we had we kind of had a gut instinct, um, given what we know about other birds in the tropics, um, that these snail kites are probably not staying put. So the study question really was very, very simple, very basic, because so little is known right now. What we basically wanted to do is just get a basic understanding. What are these birds doing before we can move on to kind of deeper questions about their ecology? The first thing to basically describe is their annual cycle, right? How do they move? Where do they spend the winter, the fall? Um, yeah, in South America, it's more dry season versus wet season rather than winter versus summer. But we wanted to describe the roots, the rate and timing of their movements, um, whether they be tens of miles or hundreds of miles or thousands of miles, as well as the location of their uh, stopover sites. We knew that they were going to be going to places where they need to um, eat snails. So what we basically knew from the get-go was wh whatever these kites are, are gonna do, they're probably looking for snails, but snails are pretty much ever, you know, they're, they're in a lot of wetlands, a lot of rivers and lakes across um, the lowlands of uh, a continent like South America. So it was kind of an open-ended question. Now to understand, you know, the rest of this talk, you're gonna have to kind of understand the basic South American geography. So here's a really, you know, South American geography 101. These are the major rivers in South America. So what we basically have here are three major drainages. And these drainages are um, located across the continent, except maybe Patagonia. Patagonia, if anyone has ever been to Patagonia, you'll see it's mostly made up of glaciers and deserts. So excluding Patagonia, the rest of the continent is mostly drained by these three major uh, river basins. The Orinoco up in Colombia, Venezuela, mostly. Um, that's draining everything north of the Amazon River. The Amazon is the largest one, of course. It's, it's draining the basically northern and, and central South America. And uh, the, finally, the La Plata. Um, and Paraná, Paraguay River Basin, which drains the southern portion of uh, the continent. So keep in mind this Amazon drainage, as well as the La Plata drainage, they're going to play central roles in this um, research that I'm about to present to you. So the Amazon, for just a refresher course, the Amazon flows west to east. It's flowing from the Andes, basically rain falls in the Andes and moves water downwards into this Amazon basin and then eastwards towards the Atlantic Ocean. Whereas in the, in the La Plata drainage, water is basically draining out of the Pantanal, a central South American wetland, as well as Southern Brazil and, and Northern Argentina into that big river, La Plata River that drains out of the continent uh, in front of the city of Buenos Aires. So that's, yeah, that's the major metropolis in that uh, drainage. And snail kites live in all three major watersheds, the Orinoco, the Amazon, and the La Plata. So they have a lot of options, you know. Imagine the flooding cycles, how, you know, where, where snail, snails might be found at different times of year in each one of those three drainages. And we chose to study them at this uh, study site here in uh, Southern Brazil called Taim Ecological Station because, well, first of all, it was logistically more easy than in a lot of other places. You know, when you're, when you're a biologist looking for a project, you wanna focus on what you can do, what's doable. 
especially when nobody's tried this before. So um, we knew that we could uh, set up shop there, kind of live there for several weeks. Second of all, um, our colleagues there told us that these, these birds disappeared in the winter. So Southern Brazil, it's not quite Siberia, but it gets pretty chilly and uh, windy and you know the wind comes off of the uh, Southern Atlantic Ocean and it's pretty um, cold and dry. So uh, a lot of birds leave. So we knew we would find something interesting there. And it's basically this gigantic wetland. Um, is, this is a picture of the study site when in the rainy season in the summer. So there's a lot of water, very shallow, only about a meter deep, um, but full of snails. And so that's why the snail kites like it there in uh, Southern Brazil. And there's a colony there that nests, um, it, at least it was nesting while we were there. So this is a, one of the nests we found. Snail kites nest in loose colonies. So um, a loose colony is kind of like, there's a nest here and then there's another one 50 meters away. Not like they're, they're not bunched up like albatrosses, you know, in South Georgia Island kind of situation or like puffins. They're not, they're not a very tight colony, but it's, it's a kind of a loose colony scenario. So we knew we could find snail kites there. We knew it was relatively um, logistically feasible. There was infrastructure there to, to live in. And there's a whole lot of options for those kites to go to in the winter time. So the major wetlands in that part of the continent where um, so Southern Brazil is located were um, the Pantanal. It's only a few hundred miles away. <clears throat> I mean, it's still a pretty good trip for a snail kite, but we knew, we thought maybe those snail kites, if they're not located um, there at Taim in the uh, winter, maybe they're going up to the Pantanal. Their other option was just going over a, a, about 100 miles or so to northern Argentina and Paraguay into the Paraná Paraguay River Basin. And this is the region where the Iguazu Falls, for example, drain into. So if anyone's been to the Iguazu Falls, you kind of know the habitat I'm talking about. A lot of uh, mix of rainforest and grassland and wetlands. So there, there was a lot of options we knew that the birds could move to at that time of year. So we basically, our hypothesis was that snail kites in southern Brazil um, are going to move a few hundred miles over into these wetlands, similar to what happens in Florida. That was kind of our model to follow, right? But the snail kites had other ideas, as I'm about to show you. So that's us, the team, in uh, the, at, at the study site when we just got there. Marcio, he's a... He's a Brazilian ornithologist, just got his PhD and uh, really good in the outdoors. He's a field biologist for sure. Good to have uh, when you have a, you know, when you have a problem out in the middle of nowhere, he's, he's, uh, he's very adaptable. And I'm about to show you some of the things he did to, to catch these kites. Joaquin is uh, actually from Argentina. So he came to Brazil to help us because he's got a lot of experience tagging eagles. So I'll, I'm going to show you what he did here in a second, but his experience tagging eagles really played into, helped us a lot in, in tracking snail kites. Um, me, of course, I uh, was living in Brazil for several years with my wife before this project. So I had the chance to kind of, uh, I, I kind of knew what kind of people to look, look for to do this project. Um, I was, certainly wasn't going to do it alone. And Adriano was a photographer hired by the Smithsonian. <clears throat> he's a Brazilian, but he's a Brazilian uh, photographer to basically document the project. And uh, not shown as Leandro. Leandro Bugoni is a professor there at the university uh, in Southern Brazil. And he was key because he, he knew all the logistical details and the biology of the snail kite up to that point. So he told me, go to Taim, you're gonna catch kites there, you'll find them. Now, knowing the kites are there and actually catching them are two different things. So the first thing to do was um, take a bunch of equipment down there and see kind of what the lay of the land was. Um, likely everything that happens either in the south, southern Brazil isn't similar to what's happening in places like Florida. So we, we knew we'd have to be adaptable. Taking kayaks, for example, because there was so much water and observing the kites. What are they doing? 
And so to catch any animal, you basically have to understand it first. So we just sat there for several days looking at these birds. What are, how are they fishing for snails? How are they hunting for snails? So I want you to look at this video one more time as I play it. Look at this snail kite here. It's hunting for a snail way up in the air, maybe you know, 20, 30 feet up in the air, and then it dives down, not dives, but it descends really rapidly and it, it, it just plucked a snail off the surface of the water. Okay, that's not the way snail kites everywhere hunt snails. You might have seen them do something different in Florida. It probably depends on the depth, the water depth. So at this point, we kind of had an idea of what they do. And, and did you notice that snail kite went straight over to that little bushy area? It's kind of emergent aquatic vegetation. So that's where it's going to take the snail out of the shell. So the first thing I did was contact people who have experienced trapping these things. So obviously Ken Meyer and Gina, um, they're, they're uh, experts at this. So they're two of the authors on this paper. They invented a um, basically a trap that floats on top of the water to catch snail kites there in Florida. So I went to Gainesville um, a few years ago and they, tra they trained me. I went with Gina down to Orlando where she was catching snail kites and they trained me into how to use this trap they invented. It's called an aquatic balchatri. So do you see those little nooses in the in the trap, they're basically designed to catch that um, snail kite's leg. It's a little noose, slip knot, that will wrap around the, the leg of the snail kite when it tries to grab those snails that we're putting out there as bait. See the snails there in the middle of the trap? So this trap is floating on top of the vegetation. And um, it's you put it anywhere you see the snail kites hunting. So. The first thing you need after you make the trap is snails. How do you catch snails? Can't catch a kite without a snail kite without catching snails first. So Joaquin got to work making snail traps. Uh, I can't remember who told us how to make these, but um, you can't just go out there and pluck snails off the water like snail kites do, because believe it or not, at least at Taim, where there's you know a meter of water, you can't wait out there and see them see them. Um, it, the easiest thing to do is basically put this trap out overnight. Um, I think we put some, some bait in the trap. You have to put something smelly, some, something smelly in the trap, like a hamburger meat. I can't remember what we, we put out there, but the snails are attracted to that bait and then they get caught and then you have snails to put in the trap. It didn't work. Basically that's the, I'm not going to go into it, but the snail, Unfortunately, um, this trap didn't work in Brazil because we're not sure why, but we think it's the method that the snail kites are using to catch snails in Brazil is different than Florida. So I think we caught one. We, we must have spent almost two weeks out there and we caught one snail kite with this. So after all the effort of catching um, snails and putting that trap out there, we ended up ditching that option and um, going for a different one. And this one is called a, a verbale trap. It's a, it's a, a verbale is a trap that's also a leg noose harness, widely used to catch raptors, many different types of raptors, um, but never used to catch snail kites. And so Marcio got to work making verbale traps just to see, and we, we, we didn't know what to do at that point. We just figured we had to try something new. Um, so Marcio, fortunately, he's a surfer dude. He was <laughs> really good in the water. Uh, there's caimans in the water, but he wasn't afraid. So we, he got out there and started putting up burbale traps. And yeah, several days of this. <clears throat> it's basically a, um, a leg noose on a branch. Remember that video I just showed you where the snail kite plucked the snail out of the water and went to that vegetation? Well, we figured out which are their favorite uh, perches to open snails. So they, they have these favorite perches where they need to take that snail to open it. And it's a process. You've, that snail kite first has to 
secure the snail in its talons on that branch and then use that specialized beak to take the snail out. And it can take two or three minutes to do that. <clears throat> but during that time, if it lands on that trap, it, our hope was that it was gonna get caught. And sure enough, um, we started catching snail case. This is about two months later. <laughs> so it took a while to figure this out, but I'll spare you the details. And, and after some suffering, we were able to finally, there's Marcio getting one of the snail kites. We caught, I think a total of 10. And um, we're just sitting there watching these traps all day long. The, the snail kite isn't, um, in that trap for more than a few seconds. So we, you, have, you, know, you just can't put them out there and walk away. Um, it took a while to get the permits to use this. Of course, it's a, a, it was a, a process to get all the permitting and the logistics in place, but we finally had our snail kites um, captured and ready to um, put the satellite transmitters on them to track these movements that we wanted to study. So. Mar um, member Leandro, Leandro Bugoni is a professor there at the university. He sent out some students to help us. So there I am with one of the students who's learned how to handle a snail kite, putting a transmitter on. And the first thing you do actually before you do anything is ban, ban the bird. You wanna put a band on its leg to identify it uh, in case it gets away. So we banded the birds just like many other bands are put on other species. And then we took a bunch of measurements, trying to get an idea of the health, the health of these birds. How are they doing? Um, so one of the things that we found, you know, when you have a bird in the hand, it's so much more detail that you get out of these birds than, than when you're seeing them through binoculars. So look at these kind of specialized um, talons that they have. This is it looks like a bunch of big needles, right? We had to handle them very carefully. Um, I wouldn't want one of those things going through my skin and they have very, very powerful claws. But what we found was there's this um, kind of specialized scale on the middle talon that I don't know, we, we're guessing right now that we haven't found anything in the literature describing this. Is it specialized for Brazilian snail kites and not Florida snail kites? We don't know but it kind of looks like something that would help grip that snail. The, you can imagine when you take a snail out of the water, it's slippery, that shell is really slippery. It might be covered in algae. And so we're thinking, you know, wondering if these scales help kind of get traction, you know, to, to not let that snail shell get away as, as that snail kite is trying to extract the snail from the shell. It's just a hypothesis for now, but maybe something somebody could study down the road. And we measured the wing length. You can see the ruler there. This is, this is important because um, to understand the condition that birds are in, we, we need to know their body size first. So we're measuring their weight, but if you don't understand how big a bird is when you weigh it, you really can't understand how much of that weight is fat, muscle, bone, other things. So that's why we're doing that. And you can see the satellite transmitter there on its back that we had just attached. And then we basically, uh, and yeah, one last slide showing just how much detail you get when you have see a bird so close. It's, um, it's really beautiful. I can't help but taking one or two pictures of the feathers when I have a bird in the hand because there's so much detail. Really beautiful birds, both from far away and up close. And um, just to show you, Joaquin putting the satellite transmitter on the, uh, kite, one of the kites. As I said, he had experienced tagging of eagles. So crowned eagles live in uh, Argentina and he had caught some with a team uh, a few years earlier. So a snail kite was nothing for him after dealing with crowned eagles, which are even bigger than bald eagles. And with that data from those 10, um, we ended up tracking seven snail kites actually with those satellite transmitters. And with that data, with that data, we ended up um, drawing these maps of their migratory routes. So each one of those lines is a, is a snail uh, kite that's migrating. Um, there's uh, some that actually most 
spent the entire year. So they left, all of them left time. You can see those tracks moving northwestwards away from time. So um, most of them actually just went, did what we thought they'd do. They go, went over to um, Argentina, to those wetlands of the Paraná La Plata river drainage. However, four of those snail kites had different ideas. Two went to Northern Bolivia or the Southern Amazon basin, basically uh, about a thousand miles away. And two others, I think they were both females, went all the way north to the mouth of the Amazon River in northern Brazil. And that's quite a journey. Let me give you some details about this. So, so those, um, those snail kites that went to uh, Bolivia, they mostly hung out in the Mamore River drainage. So the Mamore River is a, one of the many tributaries of the Amazon River. And the two that went up to the um, mouth of the Amazon, they um, ended up crossing about three, well, three or four major as well as minor river drainages to get there. So they're, they're skipping a lot of different options. You know, they're, they're basically saying, we wanna go to the Amazon Delta for some reason. You know, we don't know exactly why still, but they had a lot of other options along the way that they decided wasn't a, the ideal option. Um, and, and like I said, it's quite a journey. I have took this map off of, I found it on the internet. So it's it, um, based on information I have, I think it's pretty accurate. So um, a lot of people don't know that Brazil is about the same size as the lower 48 states of the United States, excluding of course, Alaska. It's a big, big country. Um, and it has about the same population as we do, but it makes up most of South America. And these uh, snail kites that we track to the mouth of the Amazon River, I'm depicting it here on this map overlaid across the United States. It's like going from central Mexico to Canada. Um, that's the distance these birds are going, about 3,000 miles. And um, it would be like, you know, the snail kites in Florida going up to the um, central Canada to to spend the summer. So it's a long, it's a long uh, migration state. If snail kites from Florida went up to spend the summer in Hudson Bay, I think people would be a little surprised. It, as far as we know, snail kites in Florida don't leave Florida. There's some evidence that they might move to Cuba, but this is, um, this is quite a big movement compared to what was known about snail kite movements before. So what we've uh, learned is that these uh, snail kites in Brazil have very variable movements. Some go to, like I said, just a few hundred miles over to Argentina, a couple hundred miles just to spend the rest of the year in Argentina. Some go to, you know, maybe a thousand miles up to Bolivia and, and some apparently uh, go several thousand miles to Northern, Northern Brazil. And it happens rapidly, right? This, this movement that we saw, um, from southern Brazil to, to the Amazon basin took a, about, um, I mean, I think it was about four to, it was four weeks for some, those birds that moved to Bolivia, it took them about a month, four weeks to get there. The ones that moved up to Brazil, it took them about six weeks. But when they moved over areas without any rivers, we could tell from the uh, satellite telemetry that they just did it in a few hours. So they're probably moving 40, 50 miles an hour when they can. Because if they're not over water, if they're not eating snails, they're in trouble. And this was all published, um, yeah, in the Journal of Raptor Research in 2020. So uh, I can, you, if you wanna read all the details, it's all in there. And uh, it's important to publish this because Maybe some student in the future will read this and take this up as a project. I hope so. Yeah, our basic conclusions were that these snail kites are moving a lot more um, readily than we had imagined. We thought that they would move maybe with between Argentina and Brazil, maybe within southern Brazil, but they're moving across several countries. Some of them moved, um, you know, between four countries in one year. They started out in Brazil went to Argentina, then Paraguay, then Bolivia. So 
unfortunately, there's very little um, international cooperation into migratory bird research and conservation in South America. But it's going to require these international efforts to understand this, not only these uh, biological patterns, but to monitor their populations for conservation purposes. We really still don't understand what the impacts of the rapid spread of um, agriculture um, is in South America. So a lot of those habitats that we, I've been talking about, these snail kites are moving through, have been converted to soybeans, corn, rice, plantations. Um, a lot of those rivers have been dammed. There's a lot of damming of rivers now in uh, the Amazon as well as Paraguay, Argentina. So water courses are changing and no doubt food levels, snail, snail kite abundance. And a lot of that research um, from Florida, such as in this paper shows that when you change the environment, such as the water availability in Florida, it's gonna impact snail kites. So we're pretty certain that if, that, if that's the case in Florida, it's likely to be the case also in South America. In fact, snail kites in Florida, um, they experience higher rates of mortality uh, during drought, right? During dry periods, which isn't surprising. If there's no snails, they don't have as much food. And if the sites that uh, these kites, this, this species is using in South America experience the same um, trends, then they can expect uh, negative results. Yet this hasn't been studied yet, so we need to we need to get on the ball and do that. And as part of that, um, we need to do more tracking. I would think um, you know we only tracked seven of those kites, so these are just very preliminary results. What are the movement patterns of different ages and sexes? Um, there's a lot of um, evidence from other species of birds that females migrate in different ways than males. You know. A uh, juvenile might may migrate differently than a, an adult. How are genetically different are these populations? So if we just target south, southern Brazil, we might not be really doing much to help snail kites um, over in other populations. So we know that they're migrating through different populations, but where are they breeding year to year? One of the interesting patterns we found in our study was um, there was no more breeding um, snail kites in that region of where we worked in Brazil after we left because water levels changed. So we were very fortunate uh, to be able to study them when we did. Finally, how can snail kites be used as sentinels for other species and just environmental change in general in South America? Snail kites, uh, I think, have potential to do that because they're so tied into their ecosystem. And I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about this project and snail kites in general, check out the Movement of Life website at the Smithsonian. And there is a link there, um, which maybe can be emailed out later if anybody wants it, but you can write it down now if you like. Uh, do you remember Adriano Gambarini? He was the videographer on our project. He made a really nice, uh, maybe a about a 10 minute video of the project. If you wanna check that out, that's the link. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Margie and any questions you might have, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Alex. Um, I, I really appreciate your um, showing the details of what you do. Uh, it was very helpful to really understand what a field uh, ornithologist, uh, pardon me, deals with regarding raptors. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, Jean Doobie asks, uh, are the snail kites declining in South America? Can you make a generalization about that? We don't know, frankly. Um, so as far as I know, there is no you know, annual census of snail kites. Um, it's an interesting question because we could potentially dive into eBird and check it out. So I'm sure a lot of you, you use eBird. Um, it's actually a big platform now for birders in Argentina. There's eBird Argentina, there's eBird Brazil as well. I, I think 
I can't remember how many users I have, but there's thousands. Um, so uh, thanks for that question. I think what I might do is contact, um, I know colleagues in Brazil who can use eBird data and I might be a great species actually to use eBird on to check the trends. Um, what I can tell you is that it's not listed as threatened. It's, um, it's not federally, it's, you know, here in Florida, in the United States, it's a federally listed endangered species, but um, it's not considered threatened at all in South America. Hopefully that's really the case. Um, but um, I think platforms like eBird and Citizen Science will be the way that we get a handle on that question. Are you still doing kite, uh, snail kite research? No, not anymore. I'm focused right now on, um, so, here in North America, I'm focused on using uh, American robins as uh, sentinel species. We're studying we're studying robins in terms of um, lead levels. So they pick up they eat worms. Worms eat soil, and there's lead in the soil and other things, other heavy metals. So we're <laughs> we're basically using robins as sentinels of heavy metals. We're also using them to study the uh, dispersal of zoonotic diseases such as West Nile virus. A lot of people don't know that. Robins are one of the main carriers, um, you know, vector, not vectors, hosts of um, West Nile virus. And we're also using them to understand climate change in North America. So that's what we're doing right now at the Midwest Center for Birds here at uh, Indiana University. And we're also in South America, we're just starting to begin studying the migration patterns of Andean flamingos, which I would be very happy to give another talk on in the future to you about it's a we're just starting that project right now, but they're already showing incredible migration patterns between Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. And it's a little worrisome because that's where all the lithium mining is happening for all these electric vehicles. So snail kites, Indian flamingos, a lot of birds to study in South America. And I would encourage anyone out there looking for a research project to go to South America. <laughs> Has anybody taken over your research or followed up on it? No, um, no. Wow. It's really a, a problem of funding in terms of, um, it's, a, it's kind of a multi-pronged problem. It's not just funding. Funding is one of them, but the other problem is that, um, you know, there's just a very few people who are um, interested in going out there, you know, and you know, I don't think I don't think a lot of the students these days know that there's a problem like that out there with a lot of species. You know, there's a lot of investment into uh, molecular right now, biomedicine, molecular genetics. You know, lab work is is uh, very well funded and um, a big part of research on university campuses. But field ornithology, you know, this kind of research, we need to get the word out that it's more it's it's really necessary. And I think, I think there's lots of people, students, young and old that would love to do, you know, get in a kayak, <laughs> spend the day getting, you know, getting paid to chase snail kites around. I think, I just don't think a lot of people realize that that's an option as a career, but it, it can be a career. So um, I'm happy to work with anybody who wants to go back. I would love to go back to the snail kites myself, but um, there's only so much I can do on, you know, we always have a full plate. So Dorothy Gilman asked, what do these transmitters weigh and how long do they stay on? Yeah, these transmitters weigh uh, about 65 grams. So that's, um, uh, we have to, so to use them, we have to use a fraction of the per, uh, body weight of the snail kites, right? You, you can't get a permit to put these on anything that ways, uh, you know, it's not going to significantly impact their behavior uh, for one thing, and it can't be bothersome to them. So the type of harness we use as well is important. So the harness weighs next very little, uh, even less than the um, transmitter. And it was a backpack type harness that we use. This backpack is designed, is, so this backpack that we used isn't designed to fall off the kite at any specific time because we can get multiple years of data from these tags. They have, I don't know if you saw in the image I showed, but it has a um, solar panel on it. So we're gonna keep, we're, we can collect multiple years of data off of these. Uh, 
Jean, you had other questions, but uh, they disappeared off the chat. So if you'd like to ask them, please go ahead. Um, I was wondering about um, the snail kites in Florida. I know you don't specifically study them, but first of all, are kites in Florida uh, are year-round residents? Is that true? Well, it depends on what you call a resident because um, the kites say in the um, Kissimmee area or in the Okeechobee, you know, drainage, river, uh, drainage um, they are in the Everglades for that matter. They are, it, it, you know, the research coming out from the tracking that's been done from people like Ken, Gina um, and the University of Florida, they really seem to show the same type of nomadic pattern that we're finding in South America in the sense that um, if a kite breeds, you know, if it has a nest in a given wetland in one year, it's not necessarily gonna be there the next year. These birds are probably tracking water levels very, very closely because the snails are. The snails are only available um, during certain conditions like water levels. Um, and that all de probably depends on rainfall um, and temperature, humidity, and, and when there's human impacts, it probably depends on how we're moving the water around different um, drain edges. So the, the best thing I can tell you is that snail kites are nomadic. They have very uh, unpredictable ways of moving, uh, but they don't leave Florida as far as we know. In that sense, they are, they're a resident of Florida. So a breeding pair of kites, what, what, what kind of acreage do they need? What's their area? Um, so in Florida, I, off the top of my head, I, have, I don't recall if um, that's been published specifically, but it, you know, from what I understand, the um, snails, the snails that they're say feeding nestlings with during that breeding season, they're probably coming from, say, an area of um, in the immediate area around the nest. Um, I can't, I, I, I can't put a number on it. How many miles away they go on a given day? And I'm, you know, I'm frankly not sure. I can't recall a publication that states the home range size of a, a Florida snail kite. Ken Meyer would probably be uh, the reference for that. He would, he'd probably be able to answer that. What I can tell you from where we studied them in um, Brazil was it was within five square miles. They, were, they weren't going very far at all. Mm -hmm. And it probably just, just depends on how many snails are available. I, I can imagine that somewhere without many snails that they have to go further. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, Joseph Gentile asks, uh, in this movement of life um, video that you have on the screen, are, are these all snail kites here? Yeah, in the... <laughs> Amazing. I yeah, I, you know, I frankly, I don't remember where I got it from, but it's a, it's an image of the Pantanal um, in the Brazil. It's a, uh, it's a flock of snail kites. Yes, those are all snail kites. And it's one of the reasons that we decided to study this uh, migration because um, many, not several people, I should say, several birders told us that on a regular basis, they would see flocks of thousands of snail kites in the spring yeah. or in the fall, just after breeding usually is when you see these big congregations. You don't see this in Florida, yeah. But in no. South America, if you go to the Pantanal at the right time of year, if you wanna see this, it'll probably be in November, it'll probably be September, October. Um, so, thousands of snail kites migrating together. It's, it's actually not uncommon down there. That's incredible. <laughs> Do you see, um, it, it, I don't see many more questions, but uh, and more questions, but um, in terms of contrasting um, snail kites to swallowtail kites, I know a lot of them, at least as far as I understand, they migrate from Florida, as you know, 5,000 miles one way into places like the Pantanal. Is that, that's my yeah. understanding. Yeah. And do you see numbers of swallowtail kites like this? No. So this, 
The swallowtail kite also has a South American population, just like right. the, so, but they're not found, as far as I know, um, at least everywhere I've been, I've only seen uh, swallowtail kites, you know, the South American uh, version in, in maybe a flock of do a dozen or two dozen. I mean, still more than <laughs> you see most of the time in Florida, but, you know, I know in Florida, Georgia, you, or mostly Florida, you see those big congregations in, right. the, fall, in the fall, right? I, I've never seen that um, type of congregation in South America for the, what I have seen is a, kind of a little colony of swallow kites. swallowtail kites will nest in these loose colonies as well in Southern Brazil. So they'll, they'll, they nest in the Atlantic rainforest there in Southern Brazil. And that's pretty spectacular as well, but nothing like, yeah, not, not thousands like the snail kites. So just uh, to, to be clear, um, the the swallowtail kites um, migrate very very long distances from Florida. I mean, there are two populations of swallowtail kites. I'm preaching to Alex, who knows more than I do, but um, I've been studying them as well. So they the ones from Florida spend six five about five months six months here in Florida. And yeah. then they migrate into the Pantanal, Bolivia, and that area. And then they migrate back north to, ha to nest and, and raise their babies that fledge and they all fly back to Brazil or, right. or the, the Pantanal. And is, that's correct, right? Yeah. And then there's this the other population which stays within South America. And as I understand, they're slightly more greenish in the tinge of their they're, yeah. they're, they're still blue black. I mean, they're more green black than blue black on their back of their wings. So, and they migrate from north to south, went north to from north to south and back to north within South America. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And Ken was one of the first to, I think he's the only person who's actually tracked them. Um, he told me that he, yeah, he put at least one satellite transmitter out uh, in southern Brazil on swallowtail kite, and it, I, if I recall correctly, it, it went as far as Venezuela. So, wow, that that is called austral migration, and it's what these snail kites that migrated to the Amazon Delta did. It's austral migration is basically migration within the southern hemisphere, whereas you know, the migration that we're seeing here, these birds coming back from South America, Central America right now into North America, that's called Nearctic Neotropical migration because they're, they're connecting the Nearctic to the Neotropics. Whereas Austral migration, it, it, it happens exclusively within South America or Australia. Australia also has North to South migration. So mm -hmm. in wow. Australia, they call it, I think it was first called Austral migration in Australia. And uh, we call it neotropical austral migration in South America, basically migration north to south within South America. And, and yeah, you're right. Some swallowtail kites do that. They do the austral migration. And there's, and there's swallowtail kites, we think that are just resident as well, like in the Andes, in the base of the Andes, you know, in Peru, Bolivia, there's probably snail kites that never leave several hundred square miles. They were just resident. You mean swallowtail kites or snail kites? I'm sorry, swallowtail kites, the swallowtail yeah. kites. Yeah, so we think swallowtail kites are a mix. Some are resident, some are austral migrants. And obviously the ones up in Florida, Georgia, they're these Nearctic neotropical migrants. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. Um, I, I really, again, I really appreciate that you're a field ornithologist and I really am moved by uh, your commitment to understand these big sweeping um, movements of kites. Uh, thank you so much for what you do. And, and I hope that if you wanna do more of this research that the, the gods and goddesses of, the, of planet earth take care of you and what you wanna do because uh, it's, it's <laughs> fascinating and, and it's so important. So thank you for your, and also for what you're doing now, your commitment to really understanding how uh, we humans uh, deal with birds and should be treating them far more preciously and carefully. So thank you so much. 
I agree, Margie. Thank you. Thank, thanks Thank to you. all of you guys for Thank supporting. Thank you, Alex. It was absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, so many insights. We always learn something. It's just we fantastic. Sure mm -hmm. Yep, that's nature. We're, we're never going to stop learning. Yep, so that's right. So thank, thank you, you again, and um, I'd, I'd really like to encourage everybody, Alex, you too. Uh, we're going, in May, we're going to have uh, on Zoom uh, a preview. I mean, it's a full length, 76-minute uh, film um, that is called Full Circle about Common and Roseate Turns, and um, somebody that, uh, worked actually at the Museum of Natural History, found a, a, a delightful uh, citizen scientist who discovered where they were nesting off of uh, New, York, uh, New York City and off of Fire Island. And uh, she's done an absolutely gorgeous um, uh, full length feature film, which is going to be released commercially this summer. So we get to see it for free as long as we don't copy it while we watch it. And uh, she's totally committed to our learning. She's an, uh, a birder like a lot of us and totally committed to uh, conservation of terns. And you'll find it, the film is named Full Circle because I don't recall exactly, but I think they fly to the Canary Islands in, and some of them fly to South America. And they follow the 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 um, film follows them not just to where they're nesting in the islands off of New York City. Shall so we watch the trailer, Margie? Would you can I, you see I, it? My screen. Uh, I can see uh, slides. You want to run the trailer for a minute? Here's the trailer. Yay! <laughs> People from the Museum of Natural History knew that at one point in time, Great Gull Island is the site of a major tern colony, but the terns were in decline. When I came to the museum, a lady in education called me one day and asked me if I'd like to go to Gull Island. And I thought it looked like a terrific place to try and increase the numbers of terns. It would mean we'd need a team to, to work. Well, you got a little bit now. It's we have a lot of people, you're right. There's two species of terns that nest on this island common terns, and then also roseate terns, which are federally listed as endangered. We got quite a few people interested, and once we had enough, we could stay on the island all summer. And so by 69, we had enough people to do that, and that's when we started it the way we do it now. I knew it was gonna be one more summer. I didn't think it would be 50 summers. <laughs> That's a surprise. It's a little garbled in the preview here, but uh, the, the, the preview, if you see it, you can go and, and review it again on the Sarasota Audubon's uh, site. Um, and it really is a very uh, interesting and engrossing film. And they're wearing those flowers on their hats because otherwise the turns go after their heads. So. <laughs> well, we look forward to that, Margie. That'll be great. Uh, another wonderful uh, presentation. Thank yes, you, thank Alex. You so much. And yeah, it's just, it, they just get better and better. It's just incredible. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Alex, and thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next month. And Alex, contact me if you want a link. You're welcome to join us. And thank have you. other people come, too. Yes, right. we'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Add you to the, the email list. And, yes, um, thank you. We also, um, your, if you are a member, your, um, check your inbox because you're, 
election um, here. You have to have to ballot. vote on, on the election. Yeah, you about, ballot about will be in your ballot. inbox. Yeah, or uh, if you don't do it, we won't have any offices. So you know, you've got to do it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful, wonderful program. And we will see you next month. Bye-bye, right. everybody. Night out. Bye-bye.